Our next speaker is Seth Godin. Seth Godin is an entrepreneur, a best-selling author, and a legendary speaker. He has a very popular blog. If you want to read it and find it, just type Seth into Google. That's all. He has 18 best-selling books. He has widely popular online workshops. Seth Godin focuses on marketing and leadership, on the spread of ideas, and on changing everything. Ladies and gentlemen, Seth Godin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. You've been here for a long day in this room. I came to Belgium because something urgent needs to be discussed, which is golf is spreading to this fine country. That according to the statistics I just looked up, there are more than 90 golf courses in Belgium, and we need to talk about that. Can we agree that golf is the worst spectator sport in the world? For two reasons. First, nothing good ever happens. Second, if something good does happen, you're not allowed to wildly cheer and applaud. You have to do that measly little whiny golf applause. Can you help me out? Do the worst little applause you can. Golf applause. That was terrible. Can you double it? Double it again. And one more time. OK, beautiful. Thank you. That is what you do for a living. If you are trying to make things better, if you are trying to change the world, if you are trying to grow your organization, that is what you do for a living. And what I want to talk about today is something pretty simple. It's what I talk about in my new book, but it goes like this. That what we get the chance to do now is work that matters for people who care. And each of those two sentences has a lot of meaning to it, and we're going to take them apart bit by bit. But before I do that, let's take a look at this uh, actual footage from a bike race somewhere in Europe. This guy's in last place, and he does what most people in last place do, which is he pedals as hard as he can. But then he realizes that there might be a different way to do it, that there might be a different approach that could bring aerodynamics to the situation and change the outcome. And what I do, if I do a good job, is I help you see things differently. So if you think this is a picture of a bat, you would be right. But if I take the picture of the bat and I turn him upside down, he's not a bat anymore. He's just a badass. Or if I take these three bats who are getting ready for bed and I turn them upside down, what you will see is that they're actually getting ready for a cocktail party. <laughs> so learning how to see is the first step. And that's why an event like Supernova is so important because it will help you see the things that are going on around you and save you a lot of time and trouble. I learned this the hard way. In the uh, early 1990s, I had something you didn't have, which was a high-speed connection to the internet. And I saw the internet coming, but I didn't get it. Because I said, how do I make what I already know how to do, a book? And I published a book about the internet that sold 1,900 copies. Even in the metric system, that's not a lot. During that same period of time, two guys at Yahoo named David and Jerry saw what I saw, but they had a blank slate. They said, what could I make if I could make anything? So they built a company called Yahoo. And at one point, my half, if I had invented it, would have been worth, I don't know, 50 billion US dollars. But my problem was, I was hooked on what do I know how to do, and they were focusing on what's possible. So where does that leave you? Well, most of you have an idea you want to sell, a product you need to grow, something you want to bring to the world. And the problem is the, the clutter, the noise. It's all around us. This picture is really fuzzy. I had a bad cold when I took it. But I'm showing it to you because of that blue box in the upper middle center. The brand manager for that product spent 100 million euros interrupting us. 100 million euros on coupons and shelving allowances, TV ads, magazine ads, radio ads. Why? So we would buy the stuff in the blue box. But I don't have a pain reliever problem, and neither do you. I buy what I always buy, the cheap one, or the generic, or the yellow box. And if you are trying to build the future, if you are trying to sell change, let's acknowledge 
you're busy trying to solve a problem that most people don't think they have, which means you're going to have to spend a lot of time yelling. We also get in trouble because we get obsessed with how hard it is to make stuff. This idea of being in the factory, that if we get the factory right, we do fine. And so the idea of the factory spread, do what you're told, make the factory go faster and faster and faster. And so now we have this factory mindset everywhere we look of people trying to build factories of one sort or another that just churn it out. And once we get the factory working, we're surrounded by people who say the same four-letter word to us over and over again. More. Get me more sales. Get me more market share. Get me more impact. And all this more adds up. It pushes us to make Average products for average people. All of these average, except for Pop-Tarts. But the idea is simple. If you want to reach everyone, the committee will push you to dumb it down, to make it average. Because average and everyone are the same thing. I'm almost done with the bad news. This is room 328 at the Julian. No, I wasn't, didn't take this last night. This is a hotel. I, maybe it's a Hyatt. At 3 o'clock in the morning, it's dark. All hotels look like this at 3 o'clock in the morning. And because they're all the same, we just buy the cheap one. Sort by price. Hotels.com, just give me a good enough hotel room. I'll take the cheap one. So is that your dream? Is that your dream to create the cheap one? I think there's something else at work here. So I don't know if any of you recognize this. This is called a record album. Sorry. In um, 30 years ago, the record industry was perfect. If I had a record and I listened to it a lot, I'd wear it out and I'd have to buy another one. Or if I liked it and I loaned it to you, I wouldn't have it anymore. I'd have to buy another one. Where would I go to buy another one? A record store. There were buildings that did nothing but sell records. And we all know what happened. It only took a couple years. Now you can get every record ever recorded for free on your smartphone anytime you want. That's impossible. The industry went from perfect to impossible. And that's what revolutions do. They destroy the perfect before they enable things that are impossible. And right now, we are living through something impossible. What is it? Everyone on Earth is now your customer. Everyone. Now, that's really good news, because you're living in a little corner of the world, and everyone on Earth is now your customer. But it comes with bad news, which is that everyone on Earth is now your competitor. And so that changes everything. We are not going to buy from you because you're down the street. We are not going to buy from you because you're local. Maybe we will if it's just a big bag of corn. But everything else, it better be better than that, or we're not going to find you. And the last bit of this is all of that yelling to all of those people has created a big problem in attention. They say that the average person on the internet has the attention span of a goldfish. And that is not being kind to the goldfish. And so what you're doing, if you're on social media, what you're doing if you're a marketer is you keep making your messages shorter. You make videos that don't need sound to be heard. You figure out how to make more and more snippets. The problem is your customers aren't goldfish. They're people. And people who are yelled at by billboards running down the road are not more likely to trust you and listen to you and buy from you. They're not more likely to change their mind. So the old model of let's find some poor schmo and go after them over and over and over again until one day they buy from us has been broken. It's broken because consumers are saying, I got a remote control and I am not afraid to use it. Belgium, like the rest of the world, you have branded yourselves to death. There is too much noise, too much clutter. All right, near where I live in New York, on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 20th Street, is the epicenter of the yoga pant district. There are six different stores within one block where you can buy a pair of yoga pants.
the dreaded yoga pant shortage is finally over. And what that means is if you own a yoga pant factory, more is not an option. That if you finally figured out how to get your supply chain working, it doesn't matter. Well, so what? It's just yoga pants, except right next door is a store that sells more than 600 kinds of cameras. And right next door to that is a store that sells every Android phone ever made. And when you buy one of those Android phones, you can go online and buy insurance from more than 10,000 companies. So if you work for an organization where they say, bring us a chart that goes up and to the right, you have a challenge. Because the old way of going up and to the right doesn't work. So you can be upset with me. You can say, this is not fair. It is not my fault that the revolution happened. You can be upset and wonder who designed this problem and who didn't read the instructions. And I will agree with you, the news is not so good. So let's take one second to be sad, and then we can go on to the good news. Okay. So the good news is this. It begins with your sunflower. Everyone wants to make their sunflower bigger and taller. How do we get more known? How do we get more change to happen? How do we make more sales? But what we forget is that in every healthy sunflower, the root system goes down at least as far as the flowers go up. That what we are doing is, yes, building a tree, making an impact, but it doesn't work unless we focus on the non-glamorous stuff instead. So we can think about this the way we think about bowling. In bowling, if you move all the pins just one inch closer to each other, you will roll a strike every time. And if you move all the pins one inch further from each other, you will never roll a strike. That what we know in our new economy is it's the proximity, the connection, the trust that are the roots of what we are building. That and our ability to tell a story. So in the US, we have this cat food called Fancy Feast Gourmet Cat Food. I'm here to tell you it's not for cats. If it were for cats, it would come in mouse flavor. No, it's for cat owners. Because the cat owners buy it because the story makes them feel good about what they did. Or consider dog food. The market in the US for dog food has tripled in the last 10 years. These both cost $45 a pound. But the last time I checked, the dogs are not happier. That's because dogs don't buy dog food. People do. And the stories that we are telling them are getting better. And there's nothing wrong with that, because it's making the people who buy the dog food happier. And that is, in fact, the customer. Or consider that ring on your finger. If you go 30 blocks uptown from, Tiffany, from the yoga pant district, you can buy a ring at Tiffany's for $6,000. Well, that's fine. You can take that brand new ring, untouched, two blocks away to the Diamond District, here in Belgium or in New York, and sell it for $1,000. So where did the $5,000 go? What's the difference between the ring you bought at Tiffany's and the ring you just sold? The difference is the story, the box, the legend, the way it made your spouse feel when you got engaged in that process. So when you go to a meeting and some wise guy says, you know what we need to do? We need to lower our price because that will get us more market share. That will get us more sales. You need to say, that, my friend, is a race to the bottom. And the problem with a race to the bottom is we might win. Or worse, come in second. So some other wise guy stands up and says, so we should raise our price. But that assumes your customers are stupid. Because if you're selling exactly what everyone else is selling, but yours costs more, hey, internet, sort by price. We're out of here. The only option is to be the only one. When you are the one and only, when the thing you make and the story you tell about it, the true story is that you are the one and only, then people will wait in line to pay for it. iPhone anyone? That's the idea. 
So if I look at the internet, there's sort by price. Here's Russian computers, sort by price. Here's coffins, sort by price. Sort by price is everywhere. It is not your friend. And it will come to your industry, and it will come to your town, and it will come to Belgium, because sort by price is what consumers do when marketers say to them, it's all the same, buy us. There's got to be another way around this. Okay, so Ted Levitt, in 1962, famously wrote about drill bits. He, the Harvard professor, said, no one buys a quarter-inch drill bit. What they buy is a quarter-inch hole. But the thing is, no one needs a quarter-inch hole. What they buy is a hole to put the lag nuts in. But they don't need to do that either. What they need is a way to put the shelf on the wall. But they don't really even need that either. What they need is a way to get the books off the floor. But they don't really need that. What they really need is the satisfaction they get from the smile on their spouse's and friend's face when their apartment isn't cluttered anymore. What they want when they buy a quarter inch drill bit is satisfaction and belonging and safety. So when you go home and someone, or you go to a cocktail party and someone says, well, what do you do? What do you make? I would like to argue what each of us do, whether we're running for parliament or making breath mints, is we make stories, we make a difference, but mostly we make change. That's what marketers do. No change, no marketing. Marketers make change happen. But we cannot change everyone. So what we've got to do is choose the smallest viable market that we can live with and obsess with them. Because we can no longer do marketing at people the only choice we have is to do marketing with them and for them. But we can't do it for everyone, so we must ask, who is it for, this marketing we're doing? What is it for? And if you're not asking that question, the change I'm making, who am I trying to change? What am I trying to change? What will I do when it's working? Then don't bother showing up in the morning, because that's our mission. That's what we do. Okay, shifting gears just a little bit. Two ways to get married. Well, there are more than two ways to get married, actually, but I'm going to talk about two ways to get married. First way to get married, go on Tinder, swipe right and propose marriage to every person you meet over and over again. This is a stupid way to get married. The other way to get married is to go on a date. If it goes well, go on another date. Wait till the third date before you tell them you're out on parole from prison, and then you meet their parents, they meet your parents, you get engaged, you get married, right? That is a sensible way to get married. So why aren't you dating your prospects? Why haven't you identified the smallest viable market and earned permission, the privilege of talking to people who want to be talked to again and again instead of spamming the world, right? That what any direct marketer will tell you is 3% response rate used to be good. But with email, it's like zero is good because everyone's sending it and no one's writing back. Spam is out of control. We don't need you to interrupt more people. We don't need you to yell at more people. That's not how you make change happen. Next big idea. For the first time in history, we have the chance to treat different people differently. You never used to be able to do that. You're still not doing it. Treating different people differently recognizes that we're not all the same. You may recognize this. This is the normal distribution. <clears throat> what it shows you is that 88% of the people are in the middle of the bell curve. They're normal. And all the people outside are weird. But there's only 12%. Don't worry about them. Worry about the people in the middle. Except, except the curve is melting. Bit by bit, day by day, the curve is melting. Because if you give people a choice, they will make a choice. If this event had been held 20 years ago, almost all the men here would have been wearing exactly the same clothes. If you give people a choice, they will make a choice. Then if we look on the iTunes store, 
If you want Jamaican polka music, you can buy Jamaican polka music. The middle, the average, the people who aren't that interested, sucked out. They don't exist. It's the edges where we get to sell. So look at this list of companies. Every one of them worth more than a billion dollars. Every one was built for weird people. And this is one of the hardest lessons for European organizations to learn is that we have to be comfortable catering to the weird, to the fringes, to people who aren't the average. Because if your motto is, hey, you can choose anyone, and we're anyone, you're doomed. Because sort by price. Because there's no room for you in the middle. OK. So why is this still so hard? It's so hard, even though it's obvious and logical, because we got trained to fit in. We got trained to do what we were told. The thing that so many people are afraid of hearing is, you know what? You're not as good as you think you are. And so we hold back. And so we try to fit in, because we don't want to get uppity, because we don't want to show hubris. Shifting gears again, then, to Facebook, to Twitter, to Insta, to Snapchat. Social media is not a tactic to grow your organization. It is a symptom that your organization is growing. That if you do things right, you might get social media as a result. But if you get good at social media, it doesn't mean you're doing anything right. And to put it really clearly, you are not the customer. You are the product. You're being manipulated. You are being talked about behind your back as a way to make you stressed so you will use it more. And I think we need to think very hard as leaders and as change makers about what we're using and why. Okay, next question. First person with the fax machine, what exactly did he do with it? Because you can't use a fax machine by yourself. So the first thing you did was you told other people to go get a fax machine. Because it works better if other people have one, too. Bob Metcalf, he's not shy, calls this Metcalf's Law. And Metcalf pointed out that the value of a network goes up way faster when you add people to it. That's how you found out about Facebook. That's how you found out about Twitter. That's how you found out about this conference. It works better when other people are using it. So many of you are busy doing a funnel analysis. How do I get people at the top so I get a few customers out at the bottom? I'd like you to think really hard about taking that funnel, handing it to your customers, and having them turn it into a megaphone. Because when your customers talk about what you are doing, it's not spam. When your customers talk about what's do what you're doing, it works. Next big idea. No one cares about cows. No one talks about cows. Cows are boring. If you see one cow, five cows, a hundred cows, they're all the same. Even cow farmers don't care about cows. But if you saw a purple cow, if you saw a purple cow, you would tell other people. Because a purple cow is remarkable. And remarkable means worth making a remark about. That's all worth making a remark about. So if what you built is worth talking about, I will talk about it. If I talk about it, you've given me a megaphone. And my status and self-esteem goes up because I get to brag about what you did. So please understand, marketing isn't what you do after you make something. Marketing is what you make. Marketing is the change you seek to make. And if you don't get that part right, don't bother doing the rest. And I get, again, how hard this is. You may have heard the Greek myth of Icarus and Daedalus. And they're put on the desert island. And Icarus says to Daedalus, here, we're going to fly away with these wings. But don't fly too high, my son, because the wax will melt and you will perish. And Icarus does not listen to his father, does not obey, does not respect authority. Flies too high, he dies. The end. Except that's not what the myth said. For 3,000 years, it said something else until they changed it. 
150 years ago. What it used to say was all of that plus the punchline. And don't fly too low. Because if you fly too low, the mist will weigh down your feathers and you will surely perish. And all of us, including me, all of us are guilty of flying too low. We have this extraordinary tool on our phone, which is an extraordinary device in our pocket. And we're using it to play words with friends and look at cat videos. Because after all, this is a real sign. Who else's risk are you supposed to play at exactly? And what I'm begging you for is grit. The grit to say, no, we're not going to ship that lousy product. No, you can't be our customer because you don't believe in where we're going. No, we're not going to have another committee meeting. We're going to make something worth it instead. That we have to have the grit to fall down and skin our knee and get back up and do it again. To build something alive and bubbling, something real. The Japanese have a great expression, kamiwaza. Kamiwaza means godlike, mythlike, the way the gods would do it, which also means human, because we're the only ones who know how to do that, to make it more human, to have the guts to say, here, I made this. Not some anonymous committee for which I'm not responsible. I made this. Frank Lloyd Wright designed this house one of the most famous houses in the world, in 15 minutes on a paper bag. And then he handed it to the client and he said, if you wish, I will build this for you. He didn't say, let's have some meetings and do some focus groups and decide exactly how to make this the house of your dreams. He said, I made this. If you wish, I will build it for you. He owned that work. And yeah, so I'm pitching you something pretty scary here. If you're afraid of flying, please don't look at this. These are um, 767s coming into the Belgian airport, sped up. And what you'll see is that they're dangerously and dramatically off course. So they quickly turn around and fly home and start over. Nope, that's actually not what they do. What they do is they adjust. They're off course from the minute they take off. And the whole way, the pilot is adjusting, because that's what pilots do. And it is cheaper to adjust now than ever before. It is cheaper to put something into the world, find out if you got it right, adjust, and do it again. And we've got to figure out how to dance with that, because this is our revolution. Three words that I'd like to highlight. The first one is this one, Saobana. If you're talking to someone from the Zulu people, you might hear the word sawabana. It means, I see you. Not like, I see your face. I see your presence. I see your parents and your grandparents. I see who you are. I see your dreams. Is there anything your customers want more than to be seen, than to be part of something? Why is it so hard for us to acknowledge that we can give them that dignity? Second word, enrollment. No such thing as mandatory education. But if someone is enrolled in the journey you want to take them on, you can say, follow me. And the third word goes with that, <clears throat> which is tension. The tension someone feels before they raise their hand. The tension of this might not work. The tension of, uh-oh. If you're going to make change happen, it means you are willingly inflicting tension on people you care about. You have to be open to that in order to do this. So this economy, this economy isn't based on making truffles faster and faster. It's based on who sees you, who trusts you, who believes you. Those are the scarce resources. As Matt Ridley famously said, no one knows how to make a mouse. No one on earth knows plastics and hardware and software and metals and supply chain to make a mouse. We need teams, groups of connected individuals. So this economy, what's it based on? One, coordination. All of you are here today. None of you will be in this building last week. Value was created by coordination. Two is trust. There's someone sitting right in front of you who's never met you before. 
but who trusts you enough to talk to you. Permission, the privilege of talking to people who want to hear from you. And the fourth one, the exchange of ideas. Because all of us are smarter than any of us. But there's two words that are underneath this that surprise people every time. None of this works without generosity and art. Generosity, because why would you connect to a selfish person? Someone who's always taking. You wouldn't. And art, because art is what we call it. When we do something that makes things better, something original, something new, something for someone specific. So yes, we have to figure out what to do with the box. If I have not that much, and I come to you and I say, I don't have that much, I can't give you any, we're being selfish. But if I say, I don't have that much, but if I give it to you, we'll both have it, then the idea spreads and value is created. The old model is scarcity. I only have a little. The new model, when it comes to ideas, is abundance, an unlimited number of people to follow online, an unlimited number of ideas, which leads us to this next idea. 5,000 years ago, Charlton Heston pioneered the idea of tribes. Tribes, groups of people who are connected by a culture, by a leader, by a goal, by a way of being. We only used to have three tribes in our lives in the old days. A spiritual tribe, a work tribe, and a community tribe. But now they're everywhere. So you got the Red Hat ladies in Antwerp and Bangalore getting together for a few martinis. You got the Red Hat guys who pay $15,000 to fly to Hawaii to enter a race they know they're going to lose. Why? They don't have water in Antwerp? That's not why they go. They go because the other Red Hat guys are there. Or these Red Hat guys who train all year round for the big day. Or the White Hat guys. You know, I cried when Leonard Nimoy died and so did a lot of other people because they were part of something. So I'm going to challenge you here. I'll time you. Ready? Go. Excellent. Stop. That was excellent. Eight seconds. That's the new European Union record. Eight seconds. One group I did it with took 28 seconds. I was sweating bullets. But every group has figured it out. Every group. And every group has a different cadence. Some are slow clappers. Some are faster. I make no eye contact. How did you figure it out? It turns out People like doing what other people like them are doing. And it turns out you each have the ability to connect them, to invent a culture, to challenge them to where they're going, be clear about it, commit to it, and communicate it again and again. Someone needs to organize the applause. Someone needs to say, this is what we're going to do next. The Beatles didn't invent teenagers. They just showed up to lead them. Bob Marley did not invent the Rastafarians. He just showed up to lead them. So I could give my entire marketing talk with one slide if I had to. It's this one. People like us do things like this. You got to figure out who the people like us are. You got to figure out what the things like this are. And then you got to make enough tension for the right people that it happens. An example you say you want? Almost no one gets a Suzuki tattoo. Because the Harley Davidson people understand that they don't make motorcycles. They make change. They change outsiders to insiders. Or that nonprofit that had a walkathon. They didn't do it to raise money, they did it to raise connection. So in the US, until recently, four million dogs and cats were killed every year. Four million by the Humane Society and the SPCA, taken off the street and killed. My friend Nathan Winograd went to work at the San Francisco SPCA. He was not in charge. He was not in authority. He had no budget. He saw this happen. He said, I will change this. Within 100 days, he had raised enough money from weird people in San Francisco. But more important, enough volunteers 
that San Francisco became the first no-kill shelter in America, one city where not one healthy dog or cat has been killed since that day. Well, Nathan left there and he went to Tompkins County, New York and did it again. Then he went to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina and he did it again. Then he went to Reno, Nevada and he did it again. Not because he could tell people what to do, but because he could organize them. He could undo the schooling thing that says that our job is to do what we are told, to fit in. The reason they want you to fit in is so they can ignore you. But you see it now. And now that you see it, you understand there's a difference between management and leadership. Management is telling people what to do. Leadership is saying, I don't know how to get there. Let's figure it out. And so this is my long argument to push you to become artists. So what is art? Right? Marcel Duchamp, art. Rene Magritte, for sure, art. But Jackson Pollock, art, yes. Even if you don't like it, especially if you don't like it. And the thing that's worth noting is that Jackson Pollock had a brother. And his brother's name was Charles. And Charles Pollock was a painter, not an artist. Charles Pollock painted just like his teacher, Thomas Hart Benton. You never heard of Charles Pollock because we don't need more painters. We don't need people who are going to copy, who want to know best practices, who are going to fit in. We need people who work with felt or with words or with steel to make something remarkable. So when the Baroness had this put into an art exhibit, it changed the world of contemporary art. The second person who put a urinal into an art museum was a plumber. And that's the distinction. So a few years ago, I went to, Sh to Shenzhen, where they made your phone. And right next to Shenzhen is the village of Dauphin, where they paint one third of all the oil paintings in the world as fast as they can. You can buy the Mona Lisa for $29. But it's not worth $29, because it's a copy. Because it's a copy. And I got to tell you, copies that come from Belgium aren't worth very much, because the duties are too high. So your best work, what is it for? I want to argue it's to make change. And change has an ugly little brother, and it's to make tension. So please don't ask me for a map. Don't ask me for step-by-step -step instructions. I can't give you a map. I can't even give you a fictional map. Because if I did, you'd be a plumber. You can go out and buy a book, right? There's a book about how to raise invisible sheep without making a mistake. But we don't need your competence, because competence is overrated. If I can write down the spec, I'll find a computer to do it, or someone cheaper than you. And so the internet shows up with its silly free hugs movement. Yeah, but this guy hates it because he worked hard to be in the expensive hugs business. They don't care. And the bottled water guy's freaking out because sales are down because everything's the same. What are they supposed to do, make it wetter? They tried this, but it didn't work. No. The answer is not more purity. The answer is kryptonite. What makes Superman interesting? Kryptonite. It might not work. We have to, as Vonnegut wrote, find a cliff, throw ourselves off, and grow wings on the way down. The internet said, here's your keyboard. Here's your microphone. Speak up. If you've got to share, share. Because if you're busy saying failure is not an option, you've just announced you don't care about success either. If you want a vivid way to remember it, the person who invented the ship also invented the shipwreck. You don't have to get on board, but if you get on board, know what you're getting into. So as I wrap this up, Italian phrase of the day, salto mortale, the dangerous leap, the leap into the void, that feeling inside that it might be too soon. Like when Gutenberg launched the printing press and 94% of the people in Europe didn't know how to read. He should have waited. Or when Carl Benz launched the car and it was against the law to drive a car. There were no roads, no gas stations, no all-night drive through liquor stores. So yes, there's a really big difference between being ready and prepared. Every single person in this room is prepared, but none of you can be ready. You can't be ready because to be ready means you're sure it's going to work. And any visit to the internet shows you that you're never sure it's going to work. That all that happens if you ride a bicycle online is you fall. And so I confess I didn't show you the end of that video.
the video about the bike race. So here it is, the end of it. It worked. You figured out the method. Your art was a breakthrough. You're in first place. And so now you say, I can go back to business as usual. I can just win and win. Except this is what always happens. <laughs> You're going to have to go invent the next thing. Isn't that great? Thanks for your attention. Go make a ruckus. Thank you. Thank you very much.